Will you tell me when? Or am I on now? Hi there. Welcome to another Dare of an Artist Talk. We're very excited to introduce Shane Forrest, a truly individual artist who's been practicing since 1979. His work has been exhibited all over the world, including Sydney and Osaka. I was intrigued to read that Shane says that he's predisposed to the unspectacular. I'm looking forward to hearing more about that. So over to you, Shane. Thank you. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank Nick's, Nick Vickers for recommending me to Derivan to give this talk and uh, for Derivan, of course, for the opportunity to present my work. Um, I'd also in particular like to thank Eliza for being so welcoming and Mick for his technical wizardry um, and also my wife Jane Naylor for putting together these images and putting up with me while I prepare for this talk. Now I'm going to read because I have actually prepared something and I've drawn a line um, with my early work uh, from about 19, I'm going to start from about 1988, uh, eight, uh, 89 and not worry about the 10 years before that. Um, so I'm just going to start with these images. So the central ones are paintings and the two on the side are from my notebook. These are glimpsed figures in doorways, enmeshed in screen doors. These are usually backlit and so flattened they appear to be on one plane. The figure, screen and background become integrated in a flash as I cycle by, more detected presences than fully realised figures. They're imprinted on my mind and when I'm painting what I've seen, I tried to pull the back plane forward and push the the front plane backwards until a state of near equilibrium is attained, at least in my mind. So just a gouache on one side and a photograph from my notebook on the other. Again, these are just glimpsed as I sort of cycled by on my way to the studio and then sort of painted mostly from memory. Now, one of my <coughs> paint, uh, heroes is Bonnard, and Bonnard wanted, he said, to show what one sees on first entering a room, what the eye takes in at one glance. One sees everything and at the same time nothing. I really like that idea um, and have sort of held on to that. Okay. Uh, these signs, I'm, I'm drawn to signs on, on walls and uh, here what I notice is the figure and the ground, so the lettering and the, the, the plane that it is painted on, advancing and retreating. They're locking at a certain stage, reaching a kind of near perfection on its way to oblivion. And often these signs, I watch them over a period of time and watch them move. This one was on a uh, railway bridge at Redfern. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now these are posters on the wall, as you can see. Uh, the engagement with street posters began as an aesthetic memory game in order to pass the time while I waited on my bicycle at the lights at a particular intersection. As each layer was pasted over, I tried to remember what was on the layer below. Deep purple layered over lime green, multicoloured, pixelated fields, day glow orange with canary yellow, exciting colour combinations and patterns presented themselves as possibilities to be used. These are quite recent, but I've been looking at them for years. The idea of carving, tearing into these layers of posters was appealing. And I began by collecting some slabs of them off a local wall. Then I made a drawing on paper, cut a stencil. I'd been working with stencils, uh, placed it on the poster slab and sprayed paint through the stencil, thus imposing an image on the surface of the poster. I cut away the image to a depth where the exposed colour was acceptable to me. 
The image sat below the surface and in most cases was broken up by the various colours, patterns and texts that were revealed and selected by me. My original painterly desire to integrate the figure and the ground, as I had in those earlier pictures of people with screens, was to some extent being satisfied by what to me at the time was what I believed to be an original working method. But more about that later. Okay, this series began almost as soon as I started playing around with posters uh, called Consumer Robusta. Having moved to Leichhardt 25 years ago, I observed not only the figures in doorways, but older Italian and Anglo-Australian Anglo women walking to and from the shops. <clears throat> Many were amply proportioned, wore bright dresses and often carried string shopping bags. Sometimes the combinations of these patterned frocks and shopping bags made for exciting displays of colour and pattern. Just as the Impressionists and Post-Impressionists applied small dots and dashes of colour to build an image that seemed to shimmer and appear less solid, so too the small print patterns on the women's dresses seem designed to break up and soften their volume. I watched these women struggling with bags and trolleys, full of shopping, often trailing a cluster of children, shopping laden prams, encapsulating small, bawling children with flaying arms and legs, their pattern dresses interacting and creating great optical delights. I began this series, Consumer Robusta, of mostly larger than life-sized shopping women by first using large slabs of multicoloured posters, approximately 2.2 metres by 1.2 metres. And I guess being used to painting on a white surface, I whitened the busy poster images with a thin layer of gesso and then made a large charcoal drawing of the figure taken from my notebook. So these are all actual people from my neighbourhood. Next, using a scalpel, I began to cut away the top layer of the poster, revealing the coloured layers below. The process of cutting out my drawing of a woman wearing a patterned fabric had a lovely reverse effect. As the more I cut away, the richer, more colourful and solid the work became. Through this process of cutting into the layers, many visual surprises were discovered. And if they were good and worked, they were kept. And if they didn't, they could be cut away until something better was found further down. Occasionally I cut right through the layered slab in search of the right colour. So I simply glued what I wanted onto the back and in this way I was able to enjoy the largely chance element of this method of building an image through deletion while still keeping some control. You are ultimately responsible for the completed work and any process is only a means to an end. I searched the street for posters which displayed lots of flesh. These pieces of flesh were torn, cut, inserted and glued to create the final faces, arms and legs, giving a skin graft like appearance, not out of place in the Australian sun drenched environment. Besides these larger works, a number of smaller works featuring consumers were made. I'll just show you some examples of the post-impressionists I referred to earlier. This is Signe and Syrah. Uh, so these smaller works were a little bit more conventional. They were featuring consumers, were made from using poster offcuts, and they combined painting and were usually done on top of a, a wooden board or something. 
so I started using uh, bits and pieces that I found in my neighbour's paper throwout, plus things that came through the, po the post box as well. This one refers to Francis Bacon, looking for bacon. This is a scene I actually saw in my street one day. That is my street, and these women actually existed. Okay, discarded product packaging was also attractive to me, and I collected bits of this on recycling day in my street. I made a series of very flat sculptural shopping figures along the principle, you are what you buy. These are just small freestanding sculptures. Okay, while collecting and constantly looking at posters stuck up all over the city, I continued to see exciting possibilities to combine patterns, colours, lettering and imagery through collage and decollage. I began to isolate some of the patterns present in the shopping figures and freed them from their figurative function, allowing them to exist in their own right as fields of pattern. Pattern, in its own right, can be a worthy subject and a psychological trigger. In examining the torn layers of posters, I began to think of these layers of messages, communications, as being fragile and constantly thwarted, interrupted by outside forces, but tenacious in their reinvigoration, regenerating overnight, and even in their torn, jumbled and sometimes tattered state, with their original message hopelessly compromised, but still broadcasting. The idea of outside interference grew in my mind, And I began to focus on the many faces that floated in overlaid fields and were often torn and overpasted, sometimes with the same face slightly displaced over the damaged one. This displacement of the face took me back to the early TV sets we owned, with their constantly rolling image, which often presented a portrait in two, sometimes three sections chasing each other in a fruitless attempt to reform. Static and flickering, creating patterned fields. I began trying to express these compromised, unreliable images by using posters collected off the street. I gradually built up a group of works around this idea and exhibited them in 2004. The veteran artist Philip Martin attended this exhibition and spoke to me about the affichistes. Affichier derived, fr derived from, uh, well, it, that, that word is derived from affichier, meaning to stick up. A French word, he knew them during his many years in Paris in the 1960s. Working in France and part of the then avant-garde, Philip Martin drew inspiration for his work from the street. He had per personal experience of this group of artists who used posters as their primary medium. These are just the images from outside interference. Ah, now this is where I have to flick forward because of a chronology glitch and we'll come back to these works a little bit later. Okay, uh, these artists who were part of the Nouveau Realists used the debris of urban life to comment directly on the society in which they lived. Officially forming in 1960, 
The nouveau realists included artists such as Klein, uh, Tingui, César, Spori, Aman, Viergle, Haynes and Christo. The movement participants were a loosely connected group whose main legacy was putting it simply to expand upon Duchamp's focus on the common object and everyday life. Although the movement was short-lived, with Klein calling for its dissolution in 1961, yes, just one year after they formed, Nouveau Realism made an important contribution to visual arts. Their use of common materials revived a process begun by the Dadaists, critique of consumerist culture, and laid the groundwork for emerging alternative cultures in the coming decade. Pop art, the situationist and fluxus movements, as well as the development of conceptual art, are all indebted to the nouveau realists. Raymond Haynes, Francois Dufresnay, excuse my French, Jacques Villagre and the Italian Mimio Rotella were part of a subgroup called the Affichistes, torn poster artists. These artists developed a working method by concentrating on using collage and found ripped posters from street advertisements. The group were questioning the dominance of abstract painting, the sanctified position of the artists as individual or star. Viergle and Haynes worked together and the two saw themselves as challenging the subjectivity and self-indulgence of the American action painters such as Jackson Pollock and William de Kooning, as well as their French equivalents in the art informal movement. Indeed, Haynes once called himself an inaction painter, resolutely opposed to the emptiness of abstract expressionism. Viergle says of his co-conspirator Raymond Haynes that he sought to transform transform the mundane into art. The picture should be considered as a world in itself. Sorry, the picture should not be considered as a world in itself, but the world itself should be seen as a picture. Some of Haynes's works have a strong abstract element, recalling textures and patterns of his supposed artistic foes, the abstract expressionists. In 1957, the critic Edmund Hume described them as having a hit-and-run lyricism, and a few were even entitled Nymphe, Water Lilies, in ironic homage to Monet's most sensual paintings. Generally, the fragments are extremely impersonal, found on the streets rather than created in the studio. As Haynes put it, my works existed before me, but nobody has seen them because they were blindingly obvious. These artists promoted the democratic nature of the production, a collaboration of the elements of nature, rain and wind, and the anonymous tearing by passers-by. Jacques Viergle attributed creation, pre his selection, to a fictitious author, Lacere Anonym, and Catherine Franklin writes, the invention of Lacere Anonym, the generic author, does not represent a negation of the author, but rather the invention of a polyglot and polygraphic author who refuses the prison of the refined ego, an author whose ambition is to make a work worthy of the human comedy, that is, an urban comedy. We can see it in this work here. Swarming with characters of every kind, or bursting like the novels of James Joyce, with a cornobation of styles. I was delighted to find out about the affichistes from Philip Martin. I distinguish my humble output from their voluminous and seemingly ideologically pure program of rigid refusal to not interfere with their collected street posters. Rotella, the Italian, however, had created double decollages by tearing down posters, 
gluing them onto canvas, then re-tearing them to attain the desired look. Along these lines, earlier on, Duchamp, Duchamp, who was a huge influence on the neorealists, once proposed that whatever he happened to see at 2pm that day was his sculpture, as he was a sculptor. So by extension, you could argue, similarly, the affichiste act of choosing which posters to pull down and exhibit is a creative act which requires judgment and would be influenced by the individual artist's training and sensibility. Chance, of course, has been embraced by the Dadaists, the Surrealists, and was also valued and raised to a mystical level by the Abstract Expressionists. The D of D collage could be interpreted as an anti-collage act, but as Martina Angelotti wrote of Rotella, in her book on pop art, published by White Star, with a single action, the act of tearing, Rotella removes the image from its serial advertising context and consecrates it into the eternal life of art. Okay, this, I've included this image because it was referred to um, in something I was reading on the Nouveau, on the Nouveau Realists, and it's by Walker Evans, an American photographer. You can see by the imagery that using posters immediately dates your work. This was done in 1931. The nouveau realists love Walker Evans because he photographed the everyday uh, world, people, objects. This is the earliest record that um, I can find to somebody elevating a poster into the world of art. He would probably not have seen it as a a fine art work. It was 1931. So this torn poster was um, seen by Walker, Walker Evans as worthy of recording. Okay, now my method of positioning, cutting, collaging, decollaging is not that different from painting with its layering, scraping back and overlaying of paint. Both mediums are plastic, and while I was originally oblivious of the affichiste's work, once aware, I was not constrained by their legacy. The poster work exhibited in Outside Interference seemed to mainly focus on ideas of instability and transience. In this exhibition, I also exhibited a number of small freestanding marquettes of silhouetted human figures walking, huddled, linked, some with umbrellas, all pierced like pegboards, edges dissolving and disintegrating. These figures, made from discarded plywood, function as serious proposals for large-scale public sculpture, but play with the idea of marquettes as a discrete genre of art in its own right. None have been made into large-scale public sculptures, but as you'll see later, I'm forever hopeful. Now, this is where I have to retreat. So please bear with me while I just skim back. Okay. Okay, 2006. Having concentrated on working with posters for some years, I had suppressed or put off following other ideas. But in 2005, I began a series prompted by stimuli that was delivered daily to my letterbox. Real estate advertising cards display on one side a floor plan for a floor plan of a nearby house, which allows you to see its number of rooms and layout in detail. On the front is a picture of the house's, house's facade. I was struck by the idea that through these cards I was able to look into neighbours' houses, at least to see the layout of their homes and the size of their backyard. The floor plans also reminded me of the flattened perspective 
of Persian paintings, often displaying a compartmentalised living space set on a tilted plane. I toyed with the idea and eventually developed a series of works on paper and high relief sculptures. Just have a little look along the top of that picture at those little minarets and onion shaped domes. Um, so I, toyed, I, I developed a series of works on paper and high relief sculptures, wall mounted cardboard painted constructions which played with the elements of floor plans intricate patterning and flattened perspective, while borrowing heavily from the Persian paintings, these works displayed elements from contemporary real estate brochures. This exhibition was titled Float and referred to the battery of objects which bristle on the roofs of modern homes designed to catch the passing radio waves, satellite signals, absorb the sun's rays, chimneys and vents allow the expulsion of smoke, fumes and aromas. These objects serve to replace the minarets and onion domes that protrude along the top of Persian paintings. The cypress pines, somewhat toperized, made the transition to this contemporary Persian suburban vision. In some of these works, as in the Persian and Indian works that in part inspired them, occupants of these buildings floated in their erotic coupling. So this is a two-dimensional one. They're all painted in acrylic. Each has one small collage element. And it was sort of fun trying to paint well enough to disguise that collage element. It's another two-dimensional one. That's a detail of that. Even the dogs are floating in erotic coupling. Okay, now I think I have to go forward again and catch up with myself. Okay, uh, I had not stopped monitoring and collecting posters, especially those featuring faces. Incidentally, while peeling and wrenching slabs of them off walls, I often encounter lots of insects living in and under them. I built up an exhibition of works using these liberated faces with, their, with this group of work, instead of imposing an image on them and cutting it into the poster, I responded to the ruptures, creases, torn edges and other damage already present. Using each poster's unique imperfections as a point of entry, I exploited these by picking at, opening up the fissures, tearing into the layers, with the resulting disturbances having the appearance of eruptions from below. In some of these disrupted areas, I embedded, uh, this is an image just recently from England that I saw, which had an uncanny appearance with work I'd done. Uh, I embedded swarms of insect stickers. The, these, the insects infest the layers, eating their way through the images from behind. Others were peeled back to reveal a raw, I'm going to catch up to that. So others were peeled back to reveal a raw meaty interior. The meat was provided by the graphic images of mints and cuts of meat in supermarket brochures which were also poked into my letterbox. I overpainted these images in order to simplify and unify them. Inserting sections of painted meat into the torn posters, I realised that the tonal contrast between the painted section of meat, it's peeling out, and the printed poster was too distracting, so I overpainted the face as well with acrylic, 
and in doing so created an image that is more painterly while still retaining its photographic poster-like appearance. So these are all coated with binder medium wherever I'm going to paint and then they're painted. They're varnished in the end with an acrylic varnish. The back of the poster is coated with binder medium as well just to seal it. In the Sydney exhibition of Deface in 2008, I included a number of smaller works. I'll just go through these meaty works. These apparently are faces from a computer game I was completely oblivious to. Uh, these, are, these are some works that I started seeing that they were putting up layers of white paper along posters. I was told later, first I was told the council was doing it, then I was told that no, a Melbourne poster company had invaded the Sydney poster scene and was taking over. So the Sydney poster people were overlaying their posters with white paper. I never found out the truth. Um, but I was delighted because uh, it just added this other lovely layer of white paper over posters and in time it started to sort of fall apart. So I collected a number of these. In researching the affichistes, I also found out that a similar thing happened in Paris and that they also collected those white poster works. These have been torn into and lolly papers have been inserted in as well to get it to sort of glitter and shimmer. Okay, so um, these are some of the smaller works uh, made from scraps of wallpaper samples, shopping brochures that advertise everything from meat, underwear, mostly flesh, and the myriad of products that bombarded us through direct marketing. Mounted on offcuts of mount board and mostly overpainted, these small experiments helped me to probe for a way forward. City maps from my last visit to Japan were also reused by layering them, tearing away, and overpainting. Japanese cities are especially multi leveled but somewhat unstable. Okay, so this is the title of the talk, The Poorest Suburb, and um, this is a series that I'm working on at the moment, I've been working on since last year. I had collected hundreds of brochures, including real estate brochures, and after some stop starts and abandonments of other lines of inquiry, I returned to the images of houses for sale. And the three to four views of each house that are given to us by the vendors through their agents. The houses are shown at their best angles and in the best light and may be very different on a given day, say at the open house. I love that word open house. View, uh, at the open house viewing. Furthermore, the recent trend of professionally dressing or styling houses for sale by specialists further added to the fiction of some of these house portraits I collected. These styled houses are easy to spot, having a corporate vogue look, and always featured warm to neutral tones. Tasteful? Bland. When making my versions of these houses, I always strip out the furniture, preferring the simplified spaces and planes of colour. These latest works are painted with acrylic on paper. Each view or layer is painted as if it will be a standalone work. I use pre-used high quality paper, which would otherwise be thrown out, given to me by artist and art teacher friends. One layer of the image is glued onto a canvas. 
These canvases are also pre-used and often found on the throwouts. The second layer of the picture is placed over the first and I lift it many times looking at the two layers until I decide what to tear away from the new layer and also what to leave revealed of the layer below. This process is repeated with the third and sometimes fourth layers and finally they are glued down with binder medium. In some works little of any given layer might be retained either by being torn away or covered up by the layer above. The remainder sections are piled up and some of these parts are used in what I call leftover works. These are fictional compositions but as I've earlier expressed, they all are to some extent fictions, these open houses. The size of the work, I might say, is determined by the size of the canvas I have at hand. So in one throw out in Leichhardt, I can probably collect enough canvases for a year. And it's really interesting, and I should start documenting all the failed paintings that I sand back, recoat, and work over. This is the pile of discarded pieces that are on the floor and I put on the table to photograph. Okay, so my interest in sculpture with big ambitions, yet unrealised, has continued to be expressed in a, a variety of still small works using a range of found materials. These particular figures are made from my old pallets, which are found off cuts of plywood. Uh, the, the, the series, The Poorest Suburb, is still in development and is allowing me to exercise some of my reoccurring interests. Uh, the interest of voyeurism, perspective, our obsession with real estate, transience, degra degradation and impermanence. It's the last three that lead me to begin to recognise the real subject of my work. The filmmaker Peter Greenaway said that there were only two subjects, sex and death. But I've begun to suspect that we can further reduce these two to something even more fundamental, which I believe to be entropy and the struggle against it. Thank you. Excellent. Job well done. Okay. <laughs>